this question about space uh, uh, is is something that uh, a lot of people, of course, um, have in their imagination through uh, science fiction. But it isn't science fiction anymore, is it? I mean, space is is a is a serious matter, and perhaps the first thing uh, we could we could come to is is really that question: What is at stake in space? Well. Um... I'm Stuart Peach. I'm the chairman of the NATO Military Committee. And I just want to assure you at the beginning that we take space very seriously. In fact, it's now an operational domain in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And of course, it affects virtually everything we do in the military sphere, from command and control to communications, surveillance, reconnaissance, and all that we achieve through our NATO command structure is enabled by space-based systems. So it's right at the heart of capability. It's not um, emerging, it has emerged. And of course, allies have been using space systems for many years. And and this is an interesting question. I mean, the you know, in NATO, you're, uh, you're the chairman of the military committee, as you say, of, of, of NATO. How are democracies working together? I mean, NATO as, a, as an organization, of course, one, one would assume is working together. But in terms of the question of space, is that fully integrated into NATO? Or do the nation states within NATO also go their separate ways? Both. So NATO nations, NATO allies, have space capabilities which they offer to NATO. And NATO is increasingly buying capacity to do its own uh, operations from space. And so it's a blend, Robin, of both. And of course, uh, the creation of space as an operational domain for the Alliance is a major step forward. And we announced last week that we will create a NATO Space Operations Center at the uh, NATO Air Command Air Base at Rammstein in Germany. And so we're moving quite quickly to bring to life this blend of nations offering capability and NATO owning capability. So it's a blend of both. And, and what not everybody understands the, these issues intimately, and certainly not as well as you do, Air Chief Marshal. What actually is being done? What, what when, when it comes down to it? I mean, one imagines, of course, satellites and global positioning systems and all that kind of thing. But even beyond that, what, what actually is the strategic thing that NATO is doing and other, other non-NATO countries are doing? Well, communications is vital to all military operations. It's been true throughout history, but it's particularly true now. And space-based communications satellite capability allows us to command and control, allows us to organize. And so right at the heart of our command and control capability, as we have done since the Cold War, we have used employed space for command and control. Communications has developed rapidly space-based communications. I know from my own operational experience, we have used it for many years, but it was quite difficult and it was often quite time consuming. It's now much more routine. You mentioned GPS. Of course, we rely on GPS. In fact, the whole world relies on GPS for many day-to-day -day routine functions. In the military, we rely on GPS for timing, for navigation, for precision. And so it is a very important that we understand that it isn't just about enabling now from space, it's about our ability to understand. So I'd include intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance as part of that. All those capabilities can be flown in space and near space. And there are different types of orbits and there are different functions that can be better delivered at high earth orbit. I'm sure you'll have subject matter experts on your panel can explain that or medium Earth's orbit or low Earth orbits. It depends on the type of capability you, you seek and you procure. So NATO is, is understands this, uh, and of course we continue to develop our capability. Just one other issue on this question of communications for, for we non-experts, which of course is most of us. Um, those of us uh, around the world who use the internet, which is a lot of us, um, rely on fiber optic cables, um, if we're lucky and we live in, a, in advanced and wealthy countries. Um, a, a lot of the talk about the future of the internet is that the delivery will be via satellites. Uh, it simply means that you could get it anywhere at high speed. Um, to what extent does that pose, insofar as that is actually on the horizon, does that pose a, a security threat? I mean, you know, hacking is a problem anywhere. Hacking into, into internet delivered or, or, or sorry, sorry, satellite delivered internet services um, potentially is a huge headache, isn't it? 
Well, as the panel evolves on this excellent forum, I think this is going to become obvious that there is about to be a surge in both volume and capability of smaller cube-based small satellites, all sorts of new technologies. And in there, for the military use of communications from space, we will need encryption, we'll need to keep ourselves secure. And so the idea that everything is in a cloud, literally and open to all, will not apply, as you would expect, to military communications or to military capabilities delivered from space. But it is true, and what you say is very true, and it would be interesting to develop during the panel is how we're about to see this proliferation, let's call it that, of new capabilities, new opportunities from particularly nano small capabilities which we can launch into space. So we in NATO, in addition to creation of space as an operational domain, in our allied command transformation based at Norfolk, Virginia in the United States, we're looking at emerging disruptive technologies and developing innovation to take advantage of this proliferation of new opportunities in space. What happens if things get nasty? Um, you know, shooting down satellites, um, as far as I know, it hasn't happened yet, but, but at some point, I mean, they're up there, they're pretty much defenseless. Um, what sort of measures do we have in place? What sort of thinking do we have in place in terms of scenario building uh, should, 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 as I say, it get nasty up there? Well, let me be clear, NATO is a defensive alliance and our, um, our capabilities in space are defensive in nature. Um, and NATO is not, is definitely not militarizing space or intending to use space in an offensive capacity. But you are right, of course you're right. There are lots of nations who are researching and developing potential use of technology. There's another problem already in space, which is congestion. There's a lot of objects, in addition to the 2,000 plus satellites that we could call satellites, there are many other objects. There's debris, there's a, a sort of debris from many decades now in space in various levels of orbit, and some estimate about 20,000 of such objects. So there is always a risk of collision. Therefore, space awareness, space understanding, these are important issues which have a military dimension. And so as we develop both our understanding as a defensive alliance, we also need to be able to come together through the convening authority of NATO at 30 allies to offer that sort of space awareness, space service, if you may call it that, to more allies and partners. And therefore I see this as a very exciting way of delivering innovation for the future within the Alliance. That question of congestion raises an, uh, an interesting uh, scenario that e even without ill intent, we could start almost literally rubbing shoulders with each other in a very crowded domain. And, and at that point, uh, I guess the question arises uh, about who's going to govern uh, space. Uh, it's a very big thing, <laughs> to put it mildly, uh, but even in the sort of, you know, the relatively close uh, domains of lower, middle and, 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 and upper orbit, uh, you know, there is this danger of congestion. Somebody's going to have to decide who has the right to the, quote, real estate up there. Um, where do we stand in terms of global governance uh, of space? Well, global governance in space is complicated. There is a treaty, the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, and it covers a great deal of ground and provides that code of international law that governs space. And NATO, as a defensive alliance, takes that very seriously. Beyond that, of course, there is an amount of room for manoeuvre within the space actors. Of course, one of the obvious answers to your question about congestion is you can move your satellite out of the way if you know there's an object in the vicinity. Of course, that consumes fuel, so you have to weigh that up very carefully. But it is. It's true that this issue of space congestion, uh, maybe that's something you can discuss with the subject matter experts on the panel, is here to stay and will only increase. And this, uh, this proliferation I talked about earlier of nano small satellites and new objects in space will only add to the number, whether it's close to the Earth in low or medium or even at high orbits at 35,000 kilometers. So it's a very real issue. Getting out, and perhaps uh, to those of us who are always excited by, by space and, and science fiction and so on, uh, as, I, as I said at the beginning, it isn't fiction anymore, it's very much a reality. What about getting a little bit further out? I mean, you know, why do we not put uh, 
architecture, uh, defensive architecture on the moon, for example? Is that something that's part of our long-term plans? I mean, uh, you know, th there are th there are ideas about obviously uh, manned missions to Mars, and they always start out scientific, but I mean, there's often a commercial and a military dimension which quickly follows. But what about further out in space? Where, where does does NATO's uh, vision uh, stop? Well, NATO is a it's not just a peaceful organization, but also uh, the sort of activities you postulate are banned by the Air Space Treaty of 1967. So the use of the moon and celestial bodies is prohibited for anything other than peaceful purposes. And there is no intention in NATO to develop space programs like which uh, to explore as nation states may indeed some are indicating their, their will to do so. We are really about using space to enable our operations in the world so that we can keep the 30 uh, allied nations, 1 billion people safe and secure. And therefore, space for NATO is very much as a defensive alliance and enabler. It's a fascinating uh, issue, isn't it, that uh, NATO, which was founded famously with uh, a, 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 the crucial Article 5, where an attack on one is seen as an attack on all. And we've, we've you know, when the war on terrorism came, uh, came about, there was this question about, well, wh where does actually, wh where are we in the world? Well, once we get above the world, um, what does an attack on a NATO country look like? I mean, you know, if one of our satellites, if a British satellite or a German satellite is is over um, Korea, is that an attack on us? Well, of course, this depends on the circumstances at the time. I think the truth is that the Washington Treaty was generated by wise people. And actually, it's proved to be a remarkably resilient text for the world as it's evolved. And we have now evolved into cyber. And of course, the question you raise has already been addressed at NATO summits recently uh, in terms of cyber as an attack. Is that covered by Article 5? To which, after deliberation, the Allies said yes. So we continue to look in all domains. In, in, in 360 degrees doesn't just apply to the geography of the world. It also applies both to the space and, of course, underwater. So this is a very interesting and live debate. But what I've encountered in this role in support of the alliance is, is very much that the basic text, the Washington Treaty, is sufficiently flexible for the world as it's evolved through the wisdom of our forebears.